Let's talk a little bit about the Federal Reserve, and I just want to put this in context before we go into details, because I face this challenge every time I talk about the Federal Reserve. When I talk about it as a, a quasi-governmental agency, uh, I get flooded with emails with people telling me, no, 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 Steph, it's, it's a private corporation, it's privately profitable, and so on, which uh, is not, I mean, anything that's given a monopoly by the government and is closely tied to government policy can't be called a merely private corporation. On the other hand, when I talk about it as a private corporation, uh, people then write back to tell me that it's entirely beholden to government and politics and power and so on. So can you talk a little bit about just the general role and context of the Federal Reserve? And then I think let's start drilling in a little bit to the corner that it's painted itself into where its interest rates are effectively zero, which is this major uh, way of trying to deal with economic problems and the fact that it's pumped all this money in the economy with very little uh, positive uh, effect. But let's talk a little bit about the Federal Reserve, its, its, its private versus public status, and then if we can deal a little bit about its uh, cornered status, I think that would be well worth talking about. Let's start with some sort of big picture view. I believe the Federal Reserve actively tries to obfuscate and hide its actual structure. I mean, the fact that you and I could even be debating with a large number of people what its ownership is and to whom it is beholden for its uh, power and operations. Um, Yes, there is a uh, board, that, yes, there is stock in the supposedly private corporation that is held by the large banks, including some foreign banks that uh, through traditions and acquisitions have come to hold the, uh, uh, the stock of the Federal Reserve. And yes, there is a nominal um, <clears throat> preferred interest payment on the, uh, per, uh, on the preferred stock. Uh, it's totally irrelevant, uh, n except to understand that the goal of the Federal Reserve in its policy actions, at least uh, very importantly, is to support the big banks. No question about the fact that they've been doing it, bailing out, buying, uh, handing out loans in huge amounts and so forth. The evidence is there. They do support the large banks. But what do they do with their profits? Uh, perhaps you know, Stefan, and I'll just ask any rhetorically uh, person watching this, do you know what the Federal Reserve does when it earns interest on the Treasury notes it holds? My understanding is it turns it back into the general Treasury. Exactly. So, uh, who is it that gains the profit, so to speak? It's the federal government, and we should say that the appointing of, appointing of the chairman and the uh, board of governors by uh, the president and advice and consent of Congress clearly means to me they are a branch, uh, although somewhat uh, uh, at arm's length from the federal government, but not very when you give all your profits back to the government, not to the supposed shareholders. I assume that uh, the Federal Reserve is kept at a distance so it's not subject to Freedom of Information Acts. <laughs> I mean, that would be one of my first guesses, so I'm certainly no expert in that area. They do want some uh, privacy, and some make some sense, but the reality is they've gone way beyond uh, necessary uh, privacy for policy decision discussion, they've actually outright hidden uh, actions, which is why uh, Ron Paul's attempt to try and get information, uh, uh, Fox News and Bloomberg both sued the Federal Reserve, saying you're a part of the government, you need to divulge as a public entity what your operations are, and they've refused. It goes on and on. They are a corrupt organization, in my view, and they try and keep it secret because what they are doing is trying to keep secret from people that money is worthless. When you look at it that way, it becomes much simpler. And when you look at what they do to manipulate interest rates, it becomes even scarier. What they do is buy up treasuries. When you buy treasuries, the price of them goes up because they're a market player and buys and creates demand. Therefore, the price goes up. When the price goes up, the effective interest rate goes down. And they do that by printing new money. They gave it to the banks, which left it on deposit and reserves, so it didn't affect the economy in an inflationary way or even very much to a recovery as the banks have not been making loans with the new money than they sold the treasuries to the Federal Reserve. But think about it going forward. This process doesn't work. You can't print up more money to drive interest rates down without the dollar and other currencies related to it also collapsing. And that's why I predict in my lifetime that there will be a repudiation of the dollar in terms of lack of confidence by the world community and therefore there will have to be an issue of a new currency with a new promise in the future that it will be redeemable and something useful most obviously something like gold or perhaps a basket of ge generally traded fungible currencies that's an extreme view and of course m in my lifetime may not be investable now but I've made lots of recommendations to buy gold and oil 
and other commodities, elect uh, agricultural commodities over the years, and they've turned out pretty much right. The one I've not been right about is interest rates. My view of that is because the Fed drove the rates down in a market manipulation that was bigger than I thought they could achieve, but I don't think they can keep it going, which is why I think it's important to see that today they were talking about removing their strong efforts to drive those rates down, their exit policy, even laying out the plan over time of selling off agency debt, raising rates, raising rate on the deposits at the Fed from the banks, all of that in a process, in a kind of a kabuki scheme to suggest that they will uh, be um, vigilant about a potential drop in the dollar. I think we are beyond the point of return no matter what they do. They've already gotten us into a mess we won't get out of. And I, I sort of feel that the large number of foreign lenders, uh, as you pointed out, the majority of the government deficit has been funded by, by foreign lenders. I think that they have US dollar holdings as assets on their books. And everyone is afraid either to stop buying or to start selling because it's going to collapse the dollar, which is going to wipe out a large amount of assets on their books, which I don't think any foreign governments or institutions really want to do. So I think there's almost a game of chicken right now, like who's going to go first in starting to dump the dollar? Because I think everybody's terrified of what's going to happen if that uh, avalanche starts going downhill. That's right. And you pointed out that not only is it true that foreigners hold so much of our debt that they are afraid of what will happen to it rather than just us, uh, and they are not dictating our policy, but let's say that our central banks often talk to their financial leaders. Uh, Tim Geithner made many trips to China, as did uh, Paulson, Hank Paulson before him, to encourage them to hold and keep purchasing our debt. I don't know how long those uh, jawboning processes can work, and I don't know how long the Federal Reserve can use backdoor operations like they did during the last crisis of currency swaps to give foreign central banks the opportunity to take the dollars from our central bank, give it to their banks, who then went out and bought some of our government debt to help prop up our mess. All of that are shenanigans behind the scenes, and in the short term are very important, and I sure expect them to be trying to kick the can down the road. But this is not going to last, in my view. In the decade or so, this thing will explode. Yeah, it can't. I mean, right now, uh, banks are not lending and borrowers aren't borrowing. Uh, I, I think there's lots of reasons for it, and you go into some in your book. Uh, uh, the obvious one is that when you can borrow money at virtually 0% interest, what is your incentive to engage in, in any kind of risky lending? Just you know, buy a couple of T-bills and uh, what's that old banker uh, rule, uh, 363, you borrow at 3%, you lend at 6%, and then you go and play golf at 3 p.m.? Uh, so I don't think that there's really any incentive for banks to, to lend, and while lending is frozen, uh, economic growth is frozen, everyone's in a paralysis, because I think a lot of people unconsciously or consciously know that this problem is coming, the, the, the debt ceiling problem is coming, businesses are sitting on a lot of cash, they're afraid to expand because of uncertain regulatory, legal, tax, and, and governmental uh, environments. Uh, so yeah, I think that there is not going to, this logjam is going to be, at some point, is, is going to have to result in a devaluing of the dollar. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, I just would add that the tricks by which you can take a fairly low but very secure uh, spread in an interest rate, multiply it by 20 through uh, leverage, uh, allow uh, uh, banks to not have to go to the markets for finding uh, creditable uh, people to uh, loan money to. They can just make it by, by, by being their own hedge funds, and you see it in the numbers. Uh, the, the banks have made most of their money by uh, supposedly playing the market as opposed to being banks. I think that should be outlawed. I think Glass-Steagall should come back. Uh, uh, many things could lower the risk. I don't think uh, banks too, should be ever too big to fail. They should just never be too, allowed to be too big, et cetera, et cetera. But the bankers and the Federal Reserve are in cahoots with the powerful uh, leaders of our country. I don't expect that to change, and therefore I do expect that we will have risks that taxpayers are expected to be paying for and bailing out in the future. Uh, you know, the egregious salaries paid to the bankers just after they got the financial backing from our government should be considered uh, reasons for anger and for uh, throwing the bums out, but it didn't seem to get much traction despite the uh, obvious, in my view, misallocation of resources. Uh, but you said it better than I did. I, you know, I think the, the system is corrupt and it's going to be difficult for anybody to uh, protect themselves unless they understand this well enough 
to make the investments that will protect them from uh, the government and the big banks. Now, listen, I think we should probably try to talk a little bit about some of the general investment trends that you think would be most helpful. Now that we've scared the pants of everyone who's watched or listened to this, uh, I think let's hold out the olive branch of, of, of hope and, and profitability. So where do you see the major sectors of investment opportunity uh, in these stormy and turbulent times ahead? Well, I would add one to the ones that I've been repeating here uh, of obviously precious metals and energy uh, in the sense that I think that particularly it's important for people to consider investments outside their home country. Uh, the problems I've mentioned in the U.S. are not alone in the U.S. There's certainly many countries that have uh, taken a, a path not unlike our own of government deficits to finance short-term improvements, but in the long term that will destroy uh, of value. Also, many governments get their fingers in the pie of taxation and so forth. So I'd add uh, opportunities. Uh, our own group has done a lot of investing in South America. We recommend things as junior mining investment opportunities in countries uh, like your own in Canada, as well as in uh, places in some, not many, but in Africa and South America and China, Asia, uh, Philippines. These are all opportunities outside your own country that you should consider. Um, but I think the one that if I were to pick, uh, I already mentioned natural gas for energy, but the one that seems most out of line with sensible reality of my be basic belief that paper currencies are just paper is that interest rates are much too low. How you invest in that is tricky. Uh, there can be direct investments through futures contracts on the government ag agency debt, but the uh, simpler... Uh, uh, ETFs are also a vehicle into which one could invest in such an uh, uh, expectation. And, and to get to the immediacy of this, to some extent rates are held down by us having a debt ceiling where the government is not going out and borrowing as much because they would then exceed their debt ceiling. They've been pilfering various slush funds around and once we get through this August 2nd deadline, even one way or another, I suspect that interest rates have to go higher, partly because they can't go lower in the short term. But think about it for the long term. What confidence do you have in the paper dollars if, in fact, they do settle and decide to spend a lot of money? Well, they're going to print a lot of money. Or if they settle and decide to be an austere situation, that could mean a very slow economy, but confidence in that economy could easily suggest bankruptcies or higher need for credit uh, coverage for potential losses, and that would also continue potentially raise interest rates, especially when the QE3 comes back to try and put the economy back on, on track again for the election coming up next year. A little bit long-winded, but my point of that is almost any scenario I see of, rates can't go much lower, and they're going to go higher, in my view. Right, so you cash under your pillow, right? What's the old joke? What's the difference between monopoly money and fiat currency? Well, at least people know monopoly money is worthless. But uh, so money, money under your pillow doesn't do you much good because it's going to be uh, turned into kindling. Uh, gold, uh, obviously a great investment. Uh, somebody pointed out to me recently that a, um, a good suit in nine, 1900 uh, cost about an ounce of gold and a good suit in 2011 cost about an ounce of gold. So it's actually uh, really tracks well with the material goods, so that's useful. Uh, I think I would certainly make a short-term uh, argument that it may be worth stocking up on some foodstuffs just to avoid some price increases over the next uh, while. But there are investment opportunities, and I think this is important to stress, there are investment opportunities other than gold, uh, which is always a good thing to have. Uh, but you have to really be judicious and careful and really, I think, understand, and you've done some, I think, really dexterous and nimble number crunching to make this case. And, to repeat the name of your book, it's a really it could be the best 15 to 20 bucks you've spent. It's available as an ebook. You can get it right away. Uh, so we'll get uh, get that out to people. Hopefully, they'll I'll put a link to it uh, on the video. But uh, there are investment opportunities. But you really need to understand the macroeconomic factors that are floating around and really uh, understand the timing of these things. If, if is that a fair way of summing up your approach at the moment? Uh, you, right on. I think uh, you and I are very much in agreement. We've had more of a conversation here than an uh, interview in the sense that I think you understand these issues well. And I, 
it's really our goal to get as many people to understand these things so that they can uh, survive the situation too. Fantastic. Well, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I'm sure we'll see each other on the other side of the apocalypse. I'll bring a spear, you bring the loincloths, and we'll have a good hunt. Thank you so much for your time this week. I'll talk to you soon.